Suraj's story began in the quiet corners of his accounting office. Numbers had always been his world, but not the kind you find in advanced textbooks. His days were filled with balance sheets, tax forms, and financial reports, and his thoughts rarely wandered far from his work. But there was something different about Suraj. He was the kind of person who asked why just a bit more than others. Why does this add up this way? Why does that number repeat itself? And why do some patterns in numbers seem so beautiful? One day, while browsing the internet during a quiet afternoon, Asura had stumbled upon an article that mentioned the Riemann hypothesis. It was a famous mathematical problem, unsolved for over a century and considered one of the greatest mysteries in the world of mathematics. The article mentioned how this hypothesis was deeply connected to the distribution of prime numbers, the building blocks of all numbers. Intrigued, Suraj read on, fascinated by the idea that something as abstract as prime numbers could hold such a mystery. He didn't understand all the details at first. The math was complex, far beyond anything he had studied. But there was something about the challenge that caught his imagination. It was as if the universe had hidden a secret in the patterns of numbers, then Suraj felt a pull, the need to uncover it. Suraj began spending his evenings at the local library, borrowing books on mathematics, then trying to catch up on concepts he had never studied. He learned about Euler, the great mathematician who had worked on similar problems, and about Riemann, whose brilliant insight had led to the hypothesis that now bore his name. The more Suraj read, the more he felt like he was piecing together a puzzle. Days turned into weeks, then weeks into months. Suraj's free time was no longer spent on leisure activities, but on studying math. He carried notebooks with him everywhere, scribbling down ideas whenever inspiration struck. His friends noticed the change in him, but Suraj didn't mind their teasing. He was on a journey, then he was determined to see it through. The real breakthrough came when Suraj started thinking about the problem in a way that was different from the traditional approach. He remembered something from his work, how he often looked for patterns in financial data, how small fluctuations could hint at larger trends. What if the same could be done with numbers? What if there was a way to look at the problem not as a rigid equation, but as a dynamic pattern? Suraj began to experiment with different ideas, always keeping things simple, relying on his intuition. He thought about how numbers behaved, how they repeated and transformed. He imagined numbers not just as static figures but as part of a larger, living system. Slowly, he started to see connections, patterns that others might have overlooked. He started with the basics, revisiting the foundations of mathematics he had learned in school. But instead of focusing on complex formulas, he trusted his instincts, searching for a simpler, more intuitive way to understand the problem. He thought about symmetries, about how numbers could reflect each other like mirrors, and about how seemingly unrelated concepts might actually be connected. Suraj's breakthrough came in the form of a realization that the patterns he had been searching for weren't just in the numbers themselves, but in the spaces between them, in the relationships that tied them together. He saw how these relationships could create a balance, a kind of mathematical harmony, and he began to see how this harmony could be the key to proving the hypothesis. It wasn't easy. There were moments of doubt or frustration when the pieces didn't seem to fit. But Suraj kept going, driven by the belief that he was on the right track. He sought out advice, read more, and slowly refined his ideas. And then, one day, it all came together. The patterns he had been seeing, the connections he had been making, all aligned perfectly. He had found his proof. When Suraj finally wrote down his findings, he knew that he had done something extraordinary. He had taken on one of the greatest challenges in mathematics and had found a way through it not with advanced theories or complex calculations, but with intuition, persistence, and a deep understanding of the beauty of numbers. Suraj's journey wasn't just about solving a problem, it was about discovering something profound about the nature of numbers, and in a way, about the nature of the universe itself. His story became an inspiration, a reminder that sometimes even the greatest mysteries can be unraveled with a simple, clear vision and a refusal to give up. As Suraj delved deeper into his studies, one concept kept reappearing in his thoughts to Euler's identity. 
It was a simple yet elegant equation that connected five fundamental mathematical constants e the base of natural logarithms, i the imaginary unit, pi the ratio of a circle circumference to its diameter, 1, and 0. The identity itself was deceptively simple, t raised to the power of i times pi equals minus 1. Suraj was captivated by this equation. The beauty of Euler's identity lay in its ability to bridge seemingly unrelated concepts in mathematics. But there was something about the minus one in the identity that intrigued him even more. It wasn't just a number, it felt like a gateway to something deeper. Suraj began to ponder the meaning of minus one in this context. He knew that minus one was the additive inverse of one, but he sensed that there was more to it than that. It was as if minus one was silently demonstrating a symmetry, a balance that mirrored the concept of zero, the additive identity. Just as zero represents a point of neutrality in addition, minus one seemed to represent a kind of balance in the realm of multiplication. This thought began to grow in Suraj's mind. He started to see minus one not just as a number, but as a symbol of symmetry, a reflection of the underlying harmony in mathematics. He imagined numbers arranged like reflections in a mirror, with minus one standing opposite one, perfectly balanced. Suraj realized that this symmetry was not just a mathematical curiosity, it was a clue. The symmetry of minus one was connected to the deeper patterns he had been searching for in the Riemann hypothesis. It hinted at a kind of balance in the distribution of prime numbers, a balance that was tied to the concept of negative and positive, of reflection and identity. With this new insight, Suraj began to re-examine his work. He looked at the patterns he had found, the relationships he had discovered, and he started to see how they all connected back to this fundamental idea of symmetry. The Riemann hypothesis, he realized, was not just about finding where prime numbers lied, it was about understanding the balance that governs their distribution, a balance that was deeply tied to the concept of minus one. This realization gave Suraj a new sense of clarity. He saw how the symmetries of minus 1 and 0 could be extended to the entire system of numbers, how they could reveal the hidden structure that underpinned the Riemann hypothesis. And with this understanding, the Suraj knew he was one step closer to proving the hypothesis. As Suraj pondered the deeper meaning of minus 1 and its symmetry, he couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to discover. He had come so far, but the journey was far from over. The unit circle, a concept he had encountered time and again in his studies, kept resurfacing in his thoughts. The unit circle was where Euler's identity was rooted, and Suraj began to wonder if the Riemann hypothesis could be connected to it as well. The unit circle was more than just a geometric shape, it was a fundamental structure in mathematics, representing all the points that are exactly one unit away from the origin in the complex plane. On this circle, every point could be described using an angle connecting the world of trigonometry to the world of complex numbers. Suraj knew that the unit circle was central to many mathematical concepts, and he started to suspect that it might also hold the key to the Riemann hypothesis. But how? Suraj wondered if the symmetries he had discovered in Euler's identity could be just the beginning, a surface-level glimpse of something much deeper. He began to explore the unit circle more closely, looking for patterns, for structures that might connect back to the distribution of prime numbers. He realized that on the unit circle, every point was a reflection of another point. Just as minus one was a reflection of one, each point on the circle had its opposite, its mirror image. This symmetry, Suraj thought, might be more than just a mathematical curiosity. It could be a clue to understanding how the prime numbers are distributed. Suraj started to see the unit circle as a kind of map, a guide to the deeper structures underlying the Riemann hypothesis. He imagined the zeros of the zeta function, points that were critical to the hypothesis, arranged along the critical line, a line that might be connected to the unit circle in a way that mathematicians had not fully understood. He wondered if the Riemann hypothesis was not just about the distribution of primes, but about finding a deeper harmony, a hidden structure that connected these primes to the unit circle. Was it possible that the zeros of the zeta function were somehow tied to the symmetries of the circle, that the circle itself was a kind of blueprint for understanding the hypothesis? The more Suraj thought about it, the more he became convinced that there was something beneath the surface, something that had not yet been uncovered. 
The unit circle with its perfect balance and symmetry is seemed to be pointing towards a deeper truth, a truth that might hold the key to proving the Riemann hypothesis. Suraj knew he was on the edge of a new discovery. The unit circle, Euler's identity, and the symmetries of minus one and one were all pieces of a puzzle, a puzzle that he was determined to solve. The journey was not over, and Suraj felt a renewed sense of purpose. The Riemann hypothesis, he realized, might be more than just a mathematical problem, it might be a way to understanding the very structure of mathematics itself. Suraj's exploration of the unit circle led him to a realization that unsettled him. The circle was elegant, with its perfect symmetries and its connection to complex numbers, but there was something about it that felt limiting. The concept of periodicity, the idea that the points on the circle repeated in a cyclical pattern seemed at odds with the natural progression of numbers on a straight line. On the number line, you could always add one more, moving forward indefinitely. But on the unit circle, you would eventually return to where you started, locked in an endless loop. This bothered Suraj. The Riemann hypothesis was about uncovering a hidden structure, but could that structure really be something that circled back on itself? The idea of rotation and periodicity felt stagnant to him, like running in place rather than moving forward. The progression of numbers, with its steady match of plus one, that was something he understood deeply, it was the way the world of numbers grew, expanded, and evolved. Suraj began to think about the tension between the linearity of the number line and the circularity of the unit circle. How could these two ideas be reconciled? He knew that the prime numbers were spread out along the number line, unpredictable and irregular, but with a pattern that seemed to elude complete understanding. The unit circle, on the other hand, was all about regularity, with every point predictable in its repetition. This contradiction led Suraj to a crossroads in his thinking. He didn't want to discard the idea of the unit circle entirely, it was too fundamental, too connected to the mathematics he had been studying. But he also couldn't ignore his discomfort with its cyclical nature. There had to be a way to connect the infinite progression of the number line with the elegant, yet confined, structure of the circle. As he pondered this dilemma, Suraj realized that perhaps the answer lay not in rejecting one idea in favor of the other, but in finding a new way to combine them. What if the unit circle could be seen not as a final destination, but as a stepping stone or a tool that could help unlock the mysteries of the number line? What if the patterns on the circle could be mapped onto the line, creating a new kind of progression, one that matched the best of both worlds? This idea excited Suraj. It was as if he had been given a new direction to explore a path that could lead him closer to understanding the true nature of the Riemann hypothesis. He knew that the journey ahead would be challenging, but he was ready. The unit circle, with all its symmetries and its connections to Euler's identity, was not the end of the road, it was just the beginning. Suraj's desire to reconcile the progression of the number line with a geometric visualization became more pressing. As an accountant, he was accustomed to seeing numbers laid out clearly, each with its place and purpose. The simplicity and order of natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, and so on, had a kind of comfort to them. Yet, when he tried to visualize them geometrically, as he had done with the unit circle, he found mathematics lacked a mechanism that could neatly encapsulate all natural numbers along the number line. Suraj wanted more than just a list of numbers, he wanted a picture, a shape, something tangible that could represent the infinite stretch of natural numbers. The unit circle had its symmetries, its rotation, but it couldn't capture the linear, ever-expanding nature of the number line. It could repeat and return to itself, but it couldn't grow. And growth was what the natural numbers were all about, each one leading naturally to the next, with no end in sight. He imagined what such a geometric representation might look like. A spiral, perhaps, that started at one and grew outward, expanding infinitely while also capturing the idea of progression. But even a spiral had its limitations, it still felt too rigid, too tied to the idea of rotation. It wasn't capturing the full essence of the number line, the way each number was both distinct and yet part of an endless chain. Suraj realized that mathematics, as it stood, didn't offer a simple way to visualize all the natural numbers in a single, coherent geometric shape. The number line was abstract, the concept rather than a picture. 
It could be drawn with dots and lines, but it didn't lend itself to a shape that could be easily grasped like a circle or a square. This realization was both frustrating and liberating. It meant that Suraj was venturing into uncharted territory, asking questions that perhaps hadn't been asked before. If such a geometric visualization didn't exist, maybe it was because no one had thought to look for it, or maybe it was because it wasn't possible. But the idea that it might be out there, waiting to be discovered, gave Suraj a new sense of purpose. He started to explore different ways of thinking about numbers beyond the traditional methods. What if, instead of trying to fit the number line into a geometric shape, he could create a new kind of geometry, one that grew and expanded like the natural numbers themselves? What if the very concept of shape could be reimagined to accommodate the infinite progression of numbers? Suraj knew he didn't have all the answers, but he was excited by the possibilities. He saw his journey as not just a quest to prove the Riemann hypothesis, but as a search for new ways to see and understand the world of numbers. The path was uncertain, but Suraj was determined to follow it wherever it might lead. Suraj's journey of exploration led him to the concept of modulus, a mathematical tool that measures the distance of a point from the origin in the complex plane. It provided a sense of magnitude, the way to understand how far a number was from zero, but it didn't solve his problem. While modulus gave a notion of distance, it didn't offer an ordered representation. The complex numbers, unlike the natural numbers, couldn't be neatly arranged in a line if they sprawled out across the plane with no clear path connecting one to the next. This lack of order troubled Suraj. As an accountant, he was used to dealing with numbers that followed a strict sequence, each fitting neatly into its place. The complex numbers, with their real and imaginary paths, seemed almost chaotic by comparison. They could be plotted on a plane, but there was no straightforward way to line them up to see them in the kind of progression that he was searching for. Suraj began to wish for a mathematical mechanism that could bring order to this chaos, something that could combine the clarity of the natural number line with the richness of the complex plane. He imagined a system where every number had its place, where the infinite progression of numbers could be visualized in a way that was both ordered and expansive. He knew that this was a tall order. Mathematics, as it currently stood, it didn't offer a solution to this problem. The number line and the complex plane were separate entities, each with its own rules and structures. But Suraj wasn't discouraged. He saw this as an opportunity to innovate to think beyond the existing frameworks and create something new. He started to sketch out ideas, drawing inspiration from the tools he was familiar with, modulus, unit circles, number lines, while also thinking about how they could be extended or transformed. What if there was a way to impose an order on the complex numbers, to arrange them in a sequence that reflected both their magnitude and their position in the complex plane? What if there was a way to combine the linear progression of the number line with the rotational symmetry of the unit circle? Suraj didn't have all the answers yet, but he was excited by the challenge. He knew that creating such a mathematical mechanism would require new thinking, new approaches, and perhaps even new mathematics. But the idea that he might be able to address a problem that had long been considered unsolvable filled him with a sense of purpose. He saw this as a natural extension of his work on the Riemann hypothesis. The hypothesis itself was about finding patterns in the distribution of prime numbers, patterns that were hidden and elusive. If he could find a way to order the complex numbers to visualize them in a new way, it might bring him one step closer to understanding these hidden patterns to unlocking the secrets of the primes. Suraj knew that the path ahead would be difficult, but he was determined to pursue it. He was driven by the belief that there was a way to bring order to the complex plane to create a system that would make sense of the seemingly chaotic world of complex numbers. And in doing so, he hoped to not only address his own problem but to make a contribution to mathematics that could help others on their own journeys of discovery. Suraj's search for a way to visualize the natural numbers in a unified structure led him to explore more advanced concepts like the Riemann sphere and Riemannian geometry. These ideas fascinated him, especially the way the Riemann sphere could map the entire complex plane onto a finite surface with a single point representing infinity. It was an elegant solution for many problems in mathematics, but it still didn't satisfy his deeper yearning. The Riemann sphere, while a powerful tool, was a two-dimensional surface embedded in three-dimensional space. 
it could represent complex numbers and extend to infinity, but it didn't provide the unified volume Suraj was searching for, a space where all natural numbers could interact with each other through mathematical operations. He imagined a volume that was not just a collection of points or lines, but a space where numbers could move, grow, and combine in ways that reflected their true nature. What Suraj was looking for was a kind of mathematical universe, a place where the linear progression of natural numbers, the symmetry of complex numbers, and the abstract concept of infinity could all coexist and interact. He envisioned a volume where numbers weren't just plotted as isolated points, but where they formed a connected, dynamic whole. This volume would have to be more than just three-dimensional, it would need to encompass the infinite possibilities of numbers, with a structure that allowed for every kind of mathematical operation. Suraj wanted a point of projection in this volume that represented true infinity, a point where all paths converged, where the endless progression of numbers finally found their limit. But such a concept was beyond the reach of traditional mathematics. Infinity was usually treated as an abstract concept, not something that could be visualized or placed within a geometric structure. Despite the challenges, Suraj was determined to keep pushing the boundaries of his understanding. He knew that what he was searching for might not exist in current mathematical frameworks, but that didn't deter him. He was inspired by the thought that new ideas, new geometries, and new ways of thinking might be needed to find the solution. In his mind, Suraj began to piece together what this unified volume might look like. It would need to incorporate the straight path of the number line, the cyclical symmetry of the unit circle, and the infinite reach of the Riemann sphere, all within a single structure. It would be a place where numbers could be both linear and circular, finite and infinite, ordered and chaotic. Suraj's journey had led him to a point where he was no longer just exploring existing mathematics, he was beginning to imagine entirely new concepts. He didn't have all the answers yet, but he was driven by the belief that somewhere, in the vast landscape of mathematical possibilities, there was a way to bring all these ideas together. And in doing so, he hoped to find the key to not just the Riemann hypothesis, but to a deeper understanding of the nature of numbers themselves. Suraj's frustration grew as he delved deeper into the mathematical intricacies he was trying to untangle. One particular concept that bothered him was the logarithm of negative numbers, especially the logarithm of minus 1. Mathematically, the logarithm of a negative number is undefined in the real number system, but in the complex plane, a solution exists, albeit a complex one. The solution was multivalued, meaning it didn't have a single, unique answer but instead required what mathematicians called branch cuts to define it properly. This notion of multivalued functions, with their need for branch cuts, felt like a compromise to Suraj. It was as if the concept itself was acknowledging its own incompleteness, requiring additional rules and exceptions to make sense. The idea that a mathematical function could have multiple values depending on how you approached it was unsettling. To Suraj, it felt like a patchwork solution, a way to make the mathematics work without fully addressing the underlying issue. He couldn't shake the feeling that there was something deeper, something fundamental, that was being missed. If the logarithm of minus 1 required such complicated machinery to be understood, perhaps the concept itself was pointing towards an incomplete understanding of the numbers and their relationships. Suraj knew that the complex plane allowed for the extension of many concepts from real numbers, but this extension often came with caveats, like the multivalued nature of complex logarithms. He wanted to find a way to reconcile these ideas in a manner that felt more complete, more unified. He imagined a system where these complications didn't arise, where the operations of mathematics could be carried out seamlessly without the need for additional structures like branch cuts. This desire for completeness or for a more elegant solution drove Suraj to keep searching. He was no longer just looking at the Riemann hypothesis, he was questioning the very foundations of the mathematical concepts he was working with. Was there a way to redefine these ideas, to find a new perspective that would eliminate the need for such complexities? Could there be a more fundamental understanding of logarithms, one that didn't require the caveats and exceptions of the current framework? Suraj knew that finding such an answer would be difficult. The concepts he was grappling with had been studied by mathematicians for centuries, and the current solutions, while complex, were well established. But he also believed that progress in mathematics often came from questioning the status quo, from looking at familiar problems with fresh eyes. 
he resolved to keep exploring uh, to keep pushing at the boundaries of what was known in the hope that he might find a way to bring clarity and order to the mathematical universe he was trying to understand. As Suraj continued his exploration, another mathematical concept began to bother him, the factorial. In its basic form, the factorial of a number is straightforward, multiply all positive integers up to that number. But when he looked closer, he noticed gaps in the picture. Specifically, there was no functional representation for negative factorials, and this absence felt like a missing piece in the puzzle. The factorial function, as it was defined, only made sense for non-negative integers. There were extensions like the gamma function, which generalized the factorial to non-integer values, but even this extension faltered at negative integers. The gamma function had poles at negative integers, which meant it was undefined there, creating an incomplete picture. This incompleteness troubled Suraj. Factorials were fundamental in mathematics, appearing in everything from combinatorics to calculus, and yet their behavior wasn't fully understood or defined across all numbers. More importantly, there was no inverse for the factorial function. In mathematics, symmetry is a powerful and often expected feature, and the lack of an inverse for factorials felt like a violation of this symmetry. It was as if the factorial function was a one-way street, once you computed it, there was no going back. Suraj saw this as another example of a concept that seemed to break down when pushed to its limits. Just like the logarithm of negative numbers, the factorial had its own set of rules and exceptions, and these inconsistencies were troubling. He began to wonder if these were clues, hints that there was a deeper, more complete framework waiting to be discovered, one that could extend the factorial to negative numbers and provide an inverse to preserving the symmetry he sought. In his mind, the idea of symmetry was not just a mathematical convenience, it was a fundamental principle of the universe. The fact that the factorial function lacked an inverse suggested to him that there was something deeper that hadn't yet been understood. What if there was a way to redefine the factorial in such a way that it maintained symmetry and not just for non-negative integers, but for all numbers? Suraj's thoughts began to shift towards the idea of creating new mathematical tools, new functions, or even new kinds of numbers that could fill in these gaps. He imagined a world where the laws of symmetry were never broken, where every mathematical operation had a counterpart, an inverse, and where the factorial function, like every other, could be extended and completed in a way that made sense across the entire number line. This line of thinking gave Suraj a renewed sense of purpose. He wasn't just trying to solve the Riemann hypothesis, he was trying to address deeper, more fundamental issues in mathematics. He wanted to create a system where every concept was complete, where every function was fully understood and every operation had a balance. It was a daunting task, but Suraj was ready to face it head on, knowing that each step he took brought him closer to the unified understanding he was seeking. Suraj's journey through the intricacies of mathematics left him with a growing sense of dissatisfaction. As he explored deeper, he realized that the picture of mathematics he had was incomplete. The gaps he noticed, like the undefined nature of negative factorials, the multivalued logarithm of negative numbers, and the lack of symmetry in fundamental operations, pointed to a broader issue. It was as if the mathematical structures that had been built over centuries were only part of the story. What troubled Suraj even more was that it seemed like no one was doing anything to address these foundational issues. In his view, the classical era of mathematics, the time when mathematicians were driven by curiosity and a desire to understand the universe, had passed. In its place, there was a growing reliance on computerized calculations and algorithms. These tools were powerful, but they were often used to solve specific problems without addressing the underlying principles. When it came to numerous unsolved problems in number theory, like the Riemann hypothesis, there was a sense of stagnation. Researchers were generating more data, running more simulations, but when it came to true understanding, they seemed clueless. The reliance on computers, while useful, didn't provide the kind of insights that could unravel these deep mathematical mysteries. To Suraj, it felt like mathematics had become more about solving problems through brute force than about uncovering the elegant, underlying truths that had driven the great mathematicians of the past. He saw a field that was content with its current state, focused on the practical and the computational, but uninterested in the kinds of fundamental questions that had always fascinated him. 
this realization was both disheartening and motivating. On the one hand, the Suraj felt alone in his quest for a deeper understanding. But on the other hand, he saw this as an opportunity, a chance to make a real contribution by thinking in ways that others want. He wanted to go beyond the numbers and calculations to ask the questions that no one else was asking and to find answers that could bring a sense of completeness to the mathematical world. Suraj knew that this path wouldn't be easy. The problems he was tackling were some of the most difficult in all of mathematics and they had stamped even the greatest minds for centuries. But he was determined to keep going, driven by the belief that there was still more to discover and that somewhere, hidden beneath the surface of what was already known, were the answers he was looking for. Suraj pondered his next steps with a sense of both urgency and excitement. If he was going to tackle the deep issues he saw in mathematics, starting with the Riemann hypothesis seemed like the most promising option. The Riemann hypothesis was not just a single problem, it was a cornerstone of number theory that held the potential to influence and reshape a vast swath of mathematical understanding. The Riemann hypothesis was famously challenging and had resisted resolution for over a century, but Suraj saw it as a gateway. Solving this hypothesis could provide insights into the distribution of prime numbers, which was fundamental to many areas of mathematics. More importantly, the successful approach to the Riemann hypothesis could serve as a springboard for addressing the other foundational gaps he had identified. Here's how Suraj envisioned starting this monumental task. 1. Stasta revisit existing work Stasta. He knew that to make progress, he needed a thorough understanding of the current state of research. This meant revisiting the work of Riemann, Euler, and others who had contributed to the theory. Understanding the nuances of existing proofs, theorems, and approaches was crucial. He also planned to delve into recent advancements to see how modern techniques and perspectives could be integrated. 2. Stasta refined his approach Stasta, as Suraj intended to build upon his own unique ideas. His exploration of the factorial, the logarithm of negative numbers, and the concept of modulus had given him insights that he believed could be applied to the Riemann hypothesis. He would refine these ideas, developing a more unified approach that could potentially address the gaps he had identified. 3. Stasta developed new tools Stasta, given his dissatisfaction with current mathematical tools, Suraj aimed to develop new ones. These tools would need to address the issues of symmetry, completeness, and order that he had encountered. This might involve creating new functions, rethinking the nature of complex numbers, or even reimagining the very structure of mathematical operations. For Stasta create a unified framework Stasta, Suraj's vision of a unified volume where natural numbers and mathematical operations could interact seamlessly was a long-term goal. He intended to start by creating a framework that could handle both the known and the unknown aspects of the Riemann hypothesis. This framework would need to incorporate his ideas about symmetry, factorials, and logarithms, providing a more complete and cohesive picture. 5. Stasta collaborate and seek feedback Stasta, while Suraj was driven by his own ideas, he knew the importance of collaboration. He planned to engage with other mathematicians, both to gain new perspectives and to challenge his own thinking. Constructive feedback would be crucial for refining his approach and ensuring its validity. 6. Stasta publish and share Stasta, once he had developed a robust approach, Suraj intended to share his findings with the mathematical community. His goal was not just to solve the Riemann hypothesis but to contribute to the broader understanding of mathematics. By publishing his work, he hoped to stimulate further discussion and exploration in the field. For Suraj, starting with the Riemann hypothesis was not just about solving a problem, it was about overhauling the current mathematical paradigm and addressing the deeper issues he had identified. It was a bold and ambitious plan, but Suraj was determined to see it through. His journey was far from over, but he felt a renewed sense of purpose. With each step, he hoped to bring mathematics closer to the unified, complete picture he envisioned. Suraj's belief that the clue to resolving the Riemann hypothesis lay within the unit circle was a guiding light for him. He envisioned a way to redraw the unit circle not merely as a geometric shape but as a structure with profound mathematical significance, incorporating Cantor's concepts of cardinality and ordinality. Stasta Cantor's work, an overview Stasta. George Cantor was a pioneer in the field of set theory and made groundbreaking contributions to our understanding of infinity. 
His work laid the foundation for modern mathematical analysis and revealed the complexity of infinite sets. Two of his major contributions were the concepts of cardinality and ordinality. One, Stasta cardinality Stasta, Kanta introduced the notion of cardinality to compare the sizes of sets, especially infinite sets. Cardinality is a measure of the number of elements in a set. Kanta showed that not all infinities are equal, some infinite sets are larger than others. For example, the set of natural numbers and the set of real numbers are both infinite, but the latter has a greater cardinality. Kanta's famous diagonal argument demonstrated that the set of real numbers is uncountably infinite, whereas the set of natural numbers is countably infinite. 2. Stasta ordinality Stasta ordinality refers to the order type of a set. While cardinality measures the size of a set, ordinality concerns the arrangement of elements in a sequence. Kanta extended the notion of order to infinite sequences, introducing the concept of ordinal numbers to describe different types of infinity and their orderings. This was crucial for understanding how different infinite sets relate to each other in terms of their structure and sequence. Stasta redrawing the unit circle Stasta. Suraj envisioned redrawing the unit circle with these Kantarian ideas in mind. His goal was to create a new mathematical object that would serve as a unified framework for all real numbers, incorporating the principles of cardinality and ordinality. 1. Stasta unit as a common factor Stasta. In his revised view, the unit circle would represent a fundamental common factor for all real numbers. Just as the number 1 is a fundamental unit in the number line, the Suraj imagined a unit circle that would serve as a base for understanding the relationship between all numbers, including complex and real numbers. This new unit would be a bridge between different mathematical structures, providing a consistent reference point. 2. Stasta Kanta's Cardinality Stasta A Suraj wanted this new unit circle to embody Kanta's ideas about different sizes of infinity. By integrating Kanta's cardinality, he aimed to create a structure where different infinities could be visualized and compared within the unit circle. This would provide a way to understand and manipulate infinities in a more intuitive manner, addressing some of the limitations of current mathematical frameworks. 3. Stasta Kanta's ordinality Stasta, the unit circle would also incorporate Kanta's ordinal numbers, representing the different orderings and sequences within the structure. This would allow for a more nuanced understanding of how numbers and sets interact, providing insights into their relationships and properties. Suraj's vision was ambitious. He saw the unit circle not just as a geometric shape but as a dynamic mathematical object that could offer new insights into all problems. By redrawing it to include Kanta's concepts, he hoped to create a framework where the Riemann hypothesis and other fundamental questions could be approached in a new light. This new unit circle would serve as a canvas where mathematical structures could be explored and understood in ways that were previously unimaginable. It would provide a more complete and unified picture of mathematics, one that integrated the various strands of theory into a coherent whole. Suraj knew that this was a challenging and uncharted territory, but he was excited by the possibilities. By integrating Kanta's work into his reimagined unit circle, he hoped to uncover new connections and insights that could ultimately lead to a resolution of the Riemann hypothesis and a deeper understanding of the mathematical universe. Suraj's next step was to see if he could fit Euler's zeta function in product form within the unit circle, hoping it would provide clues about the mysterious zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Euler's product form for the zeta function was an elegant expression representing the function as an infinite product over prime numbers. This form was not only beautiful but also deeply insightful, revealing the intimate connection between the zeta function and the distribution of primes. Suraj believed that if he could map this product form onto the unit circle, it might reveal patterns or structures that were otherwise hidden. He began by revisiting the fundamental properties of the unit circle, especially its connection to the exponential function and Euler's identity. The unit circle in the complex plane is defined by all points e raised to the power of i times theta, where theta ranges from 0 to 2 pi. This circular symmetry was a crucial aspect of many mathematical concepts, but Suraj felt there was more to uncover. Suraj started by imagining the primes as points or factors distributed around the unit circle. He knew that the zeta function, in its product form, could be expressed as an infinite product over these primes. 
His goal was to understand how this infinite product could be visualized or conceptualized within the unit circle. As he mapped the primes onto the circle, Suraj noticed that the arrangement seemed to suggest a deeper symmetry, one that hinted at the zeros of the zeta function. These zeros, which lie on the critical line in the complex plane, were the key to the Riemann hypothesis. If Suraj could understand how the product form interacted with the unit circle, he might gain insights into why these zeros exist where they do. He began experimenting with different ways of fitting the product form onto the circle. He considered the unit circle not just as a static geometric shape but as a dynamic space where complex numbers, the primes, and their relationships could be explored. He looked at how the prime factors could be represented as rotations or transformations within this space, each contributing to the overall structure of the zeta function. The more Suraj delved into this idea, the more he became convinced that the unit circle held the key to understanding the zeros. He envisioned the unit circle as a kind of its stage where the zeta function's symmetries and properties could be visualized. By plotting the primes and observing the resulting patterns, he hoped to see hints of the zeta function's zeros. Although the path was still unclear, Suraj felt he was getting closer to something significant. He believed that by fitting the Euler zeta function in its product form inside the unit circle, he was on the verge of uncovering new insights into the nature of the zeta function's zeros. This was an exciting prospect as it could potentially lead to a breakthrough in his understanding of the Riemann hypothesis. Suraj knew he was still in the early stages of this exploration, but he felt a sense of momentum building. Each step brought him closer to a deeper understanding, then he was determined to keep pushing forward, driven by the belief that the answers he sought were just within reach, hidden inside the mysterious symmetry of the unit circle. As Suraj meticulously placed each element within the unit circle, he began to see a pattern emerging. Every prime, every factor, and every step in Euler's product form seemed to align perfectly within this geometric framework. The symmetries of the unit circle, combined with the inherent properties of the zeta function, started to reveal something profound. The more Suraj analyzed, the clearer it became. The pattern he was seeing was not random, it was precise and elegant. The zeros of the zeta function, those enigmatic points that mathematicians had been searching for, were not scattered arbitrarily. They followed a specific pathway, a pathway that Suraj now so clearly mapped out within the unit circle. He likened this discovery to finding an address on a map. The unit circle was like a city grid, and the zeros of the zeta function were like houses on a particular street. This street, however, was not just any street. It was the half street or the critical line in the complex plane where the real part is one half. Mathematicians had long suspected that all non-trivial zeros of the zeta function lay on this line, and Suraj's construction within the unit circle was confirming this. Suraj realized that this half street wasn't just a mathematical curiosity, it was a natural consequence of the symmetries embedded in the unit circle. The zeta function, when expressed in its product form and fitted within this framework, naturally aligned its zeros along this critical line. It was as if the unit circle was guiding the zeta function's behavior, dictating where its zeros could and could not be. This realization was thrilling for Suraj. He had managed to visualize the elusive zeros of the zeta function, not as abstract points but as concrete locations within a geometric structure. The unit circle had provided a new lens through which to view the zeta function, making the complex and abstract nature of its zeros more tangible and understandable. Suraj now saw the unit circle as more than just a tool, it was a fundamental structure that connected different areas of mathematics in ways he hadn't imagined before. The placement of zeros on the half street wasn't just a coincidence, it was a reflection of deeper mathematical truths that were encoded within the circle's geometry. As he continued to refine his visualization, Suraj felt a sense of clarity and purpose. He was on the brink of something significant. The journey to prove the Riemann hypothesis was far from over, but this discovery gave him a strong foundation to build upon. Suraj knew that he needed to explore this connection further to dig deeper into the relationships between the unit circle, Euler's product form, and the zeta function's zeros. The answers were coming into focus, and he was more determined than ever to see this journey through to its conclusion. Suraj had made a breakthrough by visualizing the zeros of the zeta function along the critical line within the unit circle. 
But as he continued to explore this connection, he realized there was still an unresolved aspect how to reconcile this picture with Euler's identity, especially when considering the concept of the negative logarithm. Euler's identity, e raised to the power of i times pi plus 1 equals 0, was a cornerstone of mathematics, elegantly tying together the fundamental constants e pi, pi, 1, and 0. This identity fascinated Suraj because of the way it demonstrated deep symmetries, particularly the presence of minus 1, which symbolized a balance between opposites. But then there was the caveat of the negative logarithm. The logarithm of a negative number, when interpreted in the complex plane, introduces multivalued solutions, requiring branch cuts to define it properly. This concept had always felt incomplete to Suraj, as if it was hinting at something more profound yet elusive. Suraj began to suspect that the negative logarithm played a crucial role in the picture he was constructing. He knew that logarithms, in general, were about scaling and transformation, and the negative logarithm, in particular, involved a kind of inversion or reflection. He considered how this reflection might interact with the unit circle. The unit circle was a perfect symbol of balance and symmetry, but introducing the negative logarithm suggested a more complex interplay, something beyond simple rotation or periodicity. In mathematical terms, taking the logarithm of minus 1 led to expressions involving i pi, which directly linked back to Euler's identity. This hinted that the relationship between the zeta function, the unit circle, and Euler's identity was not just geometric but also deeply analytical, rooted in the properties of logarithms and exponential functions. Suraj started to think of the negative logarithm as a key that could unlock a deeper layer of the structure he was working with. If the unit circle provided a map for the zeros of the zeta function, then the negative logarithm might explain the underlying mechanics of why those zeros appear where they do. He explored how this might work. Perhaps the negative logarithm was related to the scaling properties of the zeta function within the unit circle. It might be that as you moved around the circle, the logarithmic scaling introduced by the negative logarithm caused the function's values to oscillate, leading to the placement of zeros on the critical line. This idea opened up a new avenue of thought for Suraj. He began experimenting with different ways to integrate the negative logarithm into his existing framework, looking for patterns or insights that would connect everything together. The more he explored, the more he became convinced that this was the missing piece. The negative logarithm wasn't just an oddity or a mathematical inconvenience, it was a crucial element that tied together the geometry of the unit circle, the symmetry of Euler's identity, and the distribution of zeros in the zeta function. Suraj's mind was racing with possibilities. He knew he was onto something, something that could potentially lead to a more complete understanding of the Riemann hypothesis. The journey was far from over, but with each new insight, Suraj felt himself getting closer to the heart of the mystery. He was determined to follow this trail to see where the interplay of geometry and analysis would lead him. Suraj's journey had led him to a profound realization to make sense of the negative logarithm in a way that fit neatly into his growing framework, he would have to grapple with the nature of imaginary numbers. Specifically, he pondered the question, what if the imaginary unit I could somehow be expressed in a real, tangible way? This idea was audacious, even unsettling. Imaginary numbers, particularly I, were foundational to complex analysis and a wide array of mathematical concepts. The equation I equals square root of minus 1 defined I as an imaginary number precisely because no real number squared gives a negative result. Yet here was Suraj, considering whether it might be possible to reframe I in a real context, at least for the purposes of his exploration. The thought stemmed from his frustration with the negative logarithm. The logarithm of a negative number, such as log minus 1, inevitably leads to a complex number involving a pi. But what if there were a way to reinterpret this so that the complexity could be translated into something more concrete, something within the realm of real numbers? He began to explore the idea by thinking about transformations. What if the imaginary unit I could be seen as a transformation or a shift rather than a static, abstract concept? In the context of the unit circle, I was related to a quarter turn, 90 degrees, rotation on the complex plane. Suraj wondered if this rotational aspect could be captured in a different way to one that didn't necessitate stepping into the imaginary realm. 
Suraj then recalled the exponential function e raised to the power of i times theta, which can be expanded into cosine theta plus i times sine theta. This was Euler's formula, which elegantly linked the exponential function with trigonometry and complex numbers. But what if this relationship could be modified or extended to include real transformations that could account for the negative logarithm? This led him to a new line of thought, what if he could define a real transformation that mimicked the effects of multiplication by i but within a purely real framework? Such a transformation might not replace i in all contexts, but it could provide a new way to approach problems where i complicates the interpretation. He began sketching out ideas, experimenting with transformations that could move points in the complex plane in a manner similar to multiplication by i. Perhaps this could involve some form of real scaling, stretching, or rotating that remained entirely within the real number system but still preserved the essential characteristics of i. As Suraj worked through these ideas, he knew he was venturing into uncharted territory. The implications of redefining i in a real context were vast and potentially revolutionary. But he also knew that this was the kind of bold thinking that might be necessary to crack the Riemann hypothesis. By attempting to realization of imaginary number A, Suraj was trying to bridge the gap between the abstract world of complex numbers and the more tangible world of real numbers. If successful, this could provide a new perspective on the negative logarithm and possibly shed light on the deep connection between the zeta function, the unit circle, and the distribution of primes. The path ahead was uncertain, but Suraj felt a growing sense of purpose. He was delving into the very foundations of mathematical thought, challenging long-held assumptions and exploring new possibilities. And with each step, he felt himself getting closer to a more complete understanding of the mysteries he was determined to solve. Suraj realized that his ideas, however intriguing, needed solid grounding if they were to be taken seriously by the mathematical community. He knew that simply proposing a new interpretation of SLN2 wouldn't be enough, he had to demonstrate why this was a natural and necessary extension of existing concepts, particularly in the context of the Riemann hypothesis. To do this, Suraj decided to revisit the calculus derivation of Euler's identity, e raised to the power of i times pi plus 1 equals 0, to see if there was any mathematical leeway to support his proposition. He began by exploring the components of Euler's identity, focusing on how the exponential function related to rotations on the unit circle and how the modulus could play a role in redefining i. As he worked through the derivations, something caught his attention. In the context of the Riemann hypothesis, where the critical line is at x equals half, Suraj noticed that if the modulus of the exponential function on the unit circle was halved, this would imply that i could correspond to ln2 in a certain mathematical framework. The reasoning was intricate but compelling. If the modulus of a complex number were reduced by half while maintaining the integrity of Euler's identity, then the component involving I would have to adjust accordingly to preserve the identity's balance. Given that the modulus affects the magnitude of the exponential function, and if the Riemann hypothesis suggested that the critical line's zeros reflect a halving of some fundamental value, then I might naturally scale to ln2. This was a radical idea that I, traditionally defined as square root of minus 1, could have an alternative or additional definition tied to the natural logarithm of 2. This definition seemed to align with the implications of the Riemann hypothesis, offering a new way to think about complex numbers and their relationship to prime numbers and zeta zeros. Suraj began to delve deeper into the justification for redefining I as ln2, a definition that felt more natural and meaningful to him. He pondered the traditional view of i as square root of minus 1, a concept rooted in the idea of taking the square root of a negative number, a mathematical curiosity that had led to the development of complex numbers. However, Suraj saw an opportunity to revisit this definition through a different lens. He considered the base of the natural logarithm, a fundamental constant in mathematics that naturally arises in many contexts, particularly in growth processes, calculus, and complex analysis. The natural logarithm, with its base e, felt intrinsically tied to the concept of natural order and progression, making it a more intuitive starting point for redefining the imaginary unit. Suraj realized that square root of minus 1 and minus 1 raised to the power of half are fundamentally about symmetry, specifically, the symmetry of the multiplicative identity. 
the relationship between half and two as reciprocal values encapsulates a deeper mathematical symmetry where one can be seen as the inverse of the other. This symmetry is elegant but it remains abstract and less visually tangible. In contrast, defining I as ln2 introduced a new dimension to the understanding of complex numbers. This definition naturally involved the base of the natural logarithm connecting the concept of I with something universally recognized in mathematics. Suraj saw this as a way to unify the concept of imaginary numbers with logarithmic properties, providing a more grounded and natural interpretation. Moreover, this redefinition carried with it a richer, more visually informative interpretation. Suraj imagined that this new perspective could enhance the conceptual resolution of the unit circle, much like adding more pixels to an image increases its clarity and detail. With I equals ln2, the unit circle wasn't just a geometric representation of complex numbers, it became a dynamic map where the interplay between natural logarithms and complex exponentials offered a higher resolution view of the mathematical landscape. This redefinition allowed Suraj to visualize the unit circle not just as a simple 2D plane but as a projection of a more complex structure where natural numbers and logarithms interacted in a deeper, more intricate way. The points on the unit circle, traditionally representing complex numbers of the form e raised to the power of i times theta, now had an additional layer of meaning, each point encapsulated not just a rotational symmetry but also a logarithmic relationship, with i representing a fundamental constant, ln2. This new perspective opened up a realm of possibilities. Suraj imagined that by redefining I, mathematicians could explore new connections between complex analysis and number theory, possibly leading to breakthroughs in understanding prime numbers, the distribution of zeta zeros, and even the nature of mathematical infinity. Suraj knew that this idea was unconventional and it would undoubtedly face scrutiny. But the potential benefits of this redefinition were too significant to ignore. By tying the imaginary unit to a logarithmic base, he was proposing a more natural, visually rich framework that could bring new clarity to some of the most perplexing problems in mathematics. With this newfound vision, Suraj felt energized. He was ready to take on the challenge of rigorously exploring this idea, testing its implications, and ultimately sharing it with the world. He believed that this could be a turning point not just in his journey with the Riemann hypothesis but in the broader quest to understand the fundamental nature of mathematics itself. Suraj knew that this proposition was bold but it also felt like a key piece of the puzzle. It was as if the mathematical universe was offering a new rule, a hidden symmetry that had been overlooked. He saw the potential for this definition of I equals ln2 to not only reconcile the complexities of the negative logarithm but also to provide deeper insight into the nature of the unit circle and the distribution of primes. However, the challenge remained uh, how to convince others of this new interpretation. Suraj understood that he needed more than just a novel idea, he needed to show how this new definition would lead to concrete, verifiable results, particularly in relation to the Riemann hypothesis. He decided to further explore the implications of this definition by testing it against known results in complex analysis and number theory. If I equals ln2 could provide a consistent and meaningful extension of existing mathematical frameworks, then it would offer the solid support needed for others to consider this radical rethinking of the imaginary unit. Suraj knew that this was just the beginning. He was venturing into a new mathematical territory, and while the road ahead was uncertain, the potential rewards were immense. If his ideas held up, they could revolutionize the way mathematicians understand the connections between complex numbers, logarithms, and the Riemann hypothesis. Suraj marveled at the beauty of the picture he had drawn in his mind. By connecting half of all natural numbers to the fulcrum point of the negative logarithm of one, he had stumbled upon a profound symmetry. This conceptual framework seemed to bind the Riemann hypothesis, the unit circle, and the mysterious nature of the imaginary unit are into a unified whole. In this picture, every natural number had its place, each linked through this fulcrum point that represented a deeper truth within mathematics. The idea that the imaginary unit could be redefined in such a way, transforming from a purely abstract concept into something with tangible connections to logarithms and natural numbers, filled Suraj with awe. The realization that half of all natural numbers, those that fell on the critical line defined by the Riemann hypothesis, were anchored to this fulcrum was a revelation. 
It suggested that the Zeta Zeros, which had long eluded full understanding, were not random or chaotic, but instead intricately connected to this deeper structure. In this new vision, I was no longer just a mysterious entity representing the square root of minus one, but something that could be visualized and understood within the context of natural numbers and logarithms. The negative logarithm of one tied to as ln2 became a central point around which the whole structure of numbers revolved. This interpretation seemed to explain why the zeros of the zeta function appeared on the critical line. They were not arbitrary, but rather expressions of this fundamental symmetry within the unit circle, a symmetry that connected the complex and real worlds in a way that had never been fully appreciated before. Suraj felt a deep sense of satisfaction. He had managed to bridge the gap between abstract concepts and concrete understanding, creating a picture that was both beautiful and meaningful. This was more than just a mathematical breakthrough, it was a new way of seeing the world of numbers, one that revealed hidden connections and underlying truths. As he sat back and contemplated this vision, Suraj realized that he was onto something profound. The implications of this idea were vast, potentially opening up new avenues of exploration not just for the Riemann hypothesis, but for the entire field of mathematics. This was the kind of insight that could reshape how mathematicians approached problems, offering new tools and perspectives that could lead to further discoveries. Suraj knew that there was still much work to be done. He needed to rigorously test this idea, to explore its implications in greater detail, and to share it with others who could help refine and develop it further. But for now, he allowed himself a moment to appreciate the elegance and beauty of the picture he had drawn, the picture where natural numbers, logarithms, and the imaginary unit all came together in perfect harmony, connected by a simple, yet profound, fulcrum point. Suraj's journey through the mathematical landscape brought him to another historical figure whose work seemed to resonate with his own ideas, Roger Coates, the British mathematician and physicist. Coates, known for his contributions to mathematics in the early 18th century, had been a contemporary of Isaac Newton and had made significant strides in understanding logarithms, particularly in their complex forms. Roger Coates had explored the relationship between logarithms and trigonometric functions, attempting to unify these concepts in a way that anticipated later developments in complex analysis. Coates is perhaps best remembered for the formula that bears his name, Coates's formula, which is a generalization of the Euler formula and relates complex exponentials to trigonometric functions. Coates's work was groundbreaking because it laid the foundation for the complex logarithm, an idea that Suraj now found himself revisiting. The complex logarithm, unlike its real counterpart, is multivalued and requires careful handling of its branches. Coates's exploration of these ideas was an early attempt to bridge the gap between logarithms and the circular functions that define the unit circle, a connection that would later be formalized by Euler. Suraj saw that Coates had been on a similar path, attempting to uncover the deeper connections within mathematics that linked different areas in surprising ways. Coates had recognized that the unit circle could be more than just a geometric construct, it could also be a canvas on which the complex relationships between logarithms, exponentials, and trigonometric functions were painted. This historical connection added another layer to Suraj's own work. He realized that by redefining the imaginary unit as ln2, he was following in the footsteps of Coates's attempt to bring logarithms into the fold of the unit circle. However, Suraj was now extending this idea into the realm of the Riemann hypothesis, where the zeros of the zeta function seemed to reside on a line that was intimately connected to this very circle. Coates's early work on the complex logarithm was a precursor to the understanding that Suraj was now developing. The idea that complex logarithms could be intertwined with the geometry of the unit circle, giving rise to a new interpretation of Euler's unification, felt like a natural progression. It was as if the work of these early mathematicians had been laying the groundwork for the insights that Suraj was now uncovering. As Suraj delved deeper into the connections between these ideas, he saw how the unit circle, traditionally associated with Euler's identity, could be imagined with this logarithmic perspective. This new face of the unit circle, one that involved complex logarithms and their relationship to the natural logarithm base E, offered a richer, more intricate understanding of the structure of numbers. In this framework, the unit circle wasn't just a simple circle of radius 1 representing rotations and symmetries. 
it was now a projection of a more complex structure where logarithms and exponentials interacted in ways that revealed deeper truths about the nature of numbers. The points on this circle were no longer just complex numbers of the form e raised to the power of i times theta, but points that encapsulated logarithmic relationships, making the unit circle a more dynamic and informative tool in understanding the fabric of mathematics. Suraj felt that by incorporating Coates's early work into his own, he was building on a tradition of mathematical exploration that sought to unify disparate concepts into a coherent whole. This new interpretation of the unit circle with its logarithmic face could potentially offer new insights into the Riemann hypothesis, prime numbers, and even the very nature of infinity. With this renewed sense of purpose, Suraj was ready to continue his journey exploring the implications of this idea and testing its validity. He knew that he was on the cusp of something significant, a new way of looking at mathematics that could bring clarity to some of its most enduring mysteries. Suraj knew that introducing a radical new idea into the world of mathematics would be met with skepticism. Mathematicians, after all, are a community rooted in rigor and consistency. They wouldn't embrace an idea simply because it was intriguing, it needed to fit within the existing structure of mathematical knowledge. This meant that Suraj had to provide something tangible, something that demonstrated the practicality and consistency of his new definition of the imaginary unit. He turned his thoughts to John Napier, the Scottish mathematician who had revolutionized arithmetic with his invention of logarithms in the early 17th century. Napier's logarithmic tables had simplified complex calculations, turning multiplication and division into addition and subtraction, and they had become an indispensable tool for mathematicians and scientists. Suraj realized that to make his idea of I equals ln2 more palatable, he needed to create a similar tool, something that would show the practical utility of this new definition. What if he could build a negative logarithmic table that could do for his redefinition of I what Napier's tables had done for multiplication? He began constructing this table to using his new definition of the imaginary number as the fulcrum point. The challenge was to find a consistent way to simplify calculations involving negative logarithms, similar to how Napier had simplified multiplication. Suraj knew that logarithms of negative numbers were traditionally defined in the complex plane, but his aim was to bring this into a more real and tangible realm. As he worked, Suraj recalled the ancient methods of finding square roots, such as the algorithm used by the Babylonians, and even earlier methods from Indian scholars. These techniques involved iterative processes that refined a guess to get closer and closer to the actual square root. Suraj's table, in a way, aimed to do something similar, but with a new twist. It aimed to find a kind of exponent for negative numbers, but one that adhered to his new logarithmic framework. In constructing his table, Suraj focused on the idea that this exponent would be very close to the absolute half of the underlying negative number, the value that resonated with the concept of symmetry he had been exploring. This absolute half, in a sense, acted like the square root in traditional calculations, bringing the negative into a manageable, almost neutral, state where it could interact with positive numbers in a meaningful way. The more he developed this table, the more Suraj saw how it connected with ancient mathematical practices. The Babylonians had used a form of averaging to approximate square roots, and this process was strikingly similar to what his table was doing with negative logarithms. It was as if he were rediscovering an old method, but through a modern lens that connected complex numbers, logarithms, and symmetry in a new way. Suraj felt that this table could bridge the gap between the abstract and the concrete. It wasn't just a theoretical tool, it could be used to simplify complex calculations, much like Napier's tables had done centuries ago. This practical application could be the key to gaining acceptance for his new ideas. By constructing this table, Suraj was providing mathematicians with a way to test and use his new definition of I. He was giving them a tool that could be applied to real problems, showing that his ideas were not just theoretical musings but had tangible, practical value. The table, with its roots in ancient methods and its branches reaching into the modern mathematical world, was a testament to Suraj's vision. It was a way to bring his ideas out of the abstract and into the hands of mathematicians who could see the consistency and utility in his work. With this, Suraj felt a sense of accomplishment. He had taken an idea that could have easily been dismissed as too radical and grounded it in something practical and historically resonant. 
Now, he was ready to present his work to the world, confident that he had built a solid foundation for others to explore and build upon. Suraj's deep dive into the history of mathematics led him to revisit the correspondences and writings of one of the greatest minds in the field, Leonard Euler. Euler's influence on Suraj's journey had been profound, and now, as he connected more dots, he found that Euler had indeed touched upon the concept of negative logarithms in his work. Euler had corresponded with several prominent mathematicians of his time, including Jean Luron de Lambert, Daniel Bernoulli, and Christian Goldbock. In these letters, Boyla had explored the implications of logarithms beyond the positive domain to venturing into the more complex territory of negative numbers and their logarithms. He had been fascinated by the paradoxes and peculiarities of negative logarithms, then while the mathematics of the 18th century wasn't fully equipped to handle these ideas in the way they are understood today, Euler's intuition had been remarkably forward-thinking. In his letters to D'Alembert, Euler discussed the logarithms of negative numbers, expressing curiosity about how these values could be interpreted and used. Euler was aware that extending logarithms into the complex plane led to multivalued functions, a concept that was not yet fully developed. He speculated about the nature of these logarithms and their potential connections to other mathematical structures, but the tools to fully explore these ideas were not yet available. Euler also shared his thoughts with Daniel Bernoulli, with whom he frequently exchanged ideas. Bernoulli was intrigued by Euler's explorations of logarithms, but like many of their contemporaries, he was cautious about the implications. The idea of negative logarithms, especially when tied to imaginary numbers, was seen as more of a mathematical curiosity than a concrete tool. Christian Goldbock, known for the famous conjecture that bears his name, was another of Euler's correspondents. In his letters to Goldbock, Euler touched upon the oddities of negative logarithms, hinting at their deeper connections to the complex plane. Euler's insights were ahead of their time, and while he didn't fully unravel the mystery of negative logarithms, he left a trail of ideas that future generations of mathematicians could follow. Suraj realized that Euler had been right all along in his view towards negative logarithms. Euler had sensed that there was something more to them, something that connected them to the broader fabric of mathematics. Suraj's work, in a way, was a continuation of Euler's explorations, pushing the boundaries of what was known and understood. By redefining I as LN2 and constructing his negative logarithmic table, Suraj was building on Euler's legacy. He was taking those early speculations and giving them a new form, one that was consistent with modern mathematical structures but also rooted in the historical evolution of ideas. Suraj felt a deep sense of connection to Euler, as if he were part of an ongoing conversation that had spanned centuries. Euler had planted the seeds, and now Suraj was cultivating them, helping them grow into something that could potentially reshape the understanding of complex numbers, logarithms, than the Riemann hypothesis. Euler's intuition, expressed in those old correspondences, was now finding its place in the contemporary mathematical landscape. Suraj saw himself as a bridge between the past and the future, carrying forward the insights of great mathematicians like Euler and transforming them into new tools and ideas for the modern world. With this realization, Suraj was more determined than ever to see his work through. He knew that the path he was on was not just his own, it was part of a larger journey that mathematicians had been on for centuries, a journey to uncover the hidden structures of mathematics and to reveal the beauty and order within the seemingly chaotic world of numbers.